Hello, I am uh, Shannon Jacobson. I am co-director uh, with Marlon Madison, who is here uh, this year here at the BCRW. This is um, the BCRW conference room, and we are very, uh, very happy uh, to co-sponsor this event with our colleagues in WGSS. I am also a professor in uh, women's gender and sexuality studies here at Barnard College, and we are here to celebrate the publication of this book. I have to say that we are here to celebrate the wonder <laughs> who is Manche Morale. So I thank you all for coming here at the end of the semester. We have no uh, new BCRW events to announce, but I will say that in the spring, our 48th annual scholar and feminist conference will be on housing justice the last weekend of february um and i invite you all to uh come out for that uh and with that i will turn it over to the sponsors of the evening the chair of wgss our good colleague rebecca jordan young welcome i'm so delighted to see a wonderful appropriately large crowd for tonight's event and we're so honored tonight to have two very special guests to help us celebrate the release of Manage's wonderful book by joining her and us in conversation. First, our guest from Chicago, Professor Nadine Neighbor, is a cultural anthropologist renowned for her work at the intersections of transnational feminisms, women of color and queer of color theory, decolonizing feminisms, empire studies, critical race studies, Middle East studies and Arab American studies. Wow. <laughs> Through critical interdisciplinary scholars, Professor Neighbor holds more positions than is humanly or at least humanely possible. And that means she is a professor in the Gender and Women's Studies Program at the Global Asian Studies Program and holds an affiliation with the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. At UIC, she's also the co-principal investigator of the Diaspora Cluster, <laughs> as well as a member of the executive committee of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, the steering committee of the Social Justice Initiative. And when she was at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, I think this is so important, um, she co-founded Arab and Muslim American Studies at, at Ann Arbor. Um, I'll say that because I subscribe to Nadine's Liberate Your Research blog, I know that there's much more that isn't making it to her official bio, but I'll have to stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks. We are also delighted to be joined by our distinguished colleague from Columbia, Professor May Nye, who we've been lucky to collaborate with on various projects and spaces in the Barnard Columbia community over the years. May M. Nye is Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History, as well as co-director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia. May's bio modestly identifies her <laughs> as a US legal and political historian interested in the histories of immigration, citizenship, nationalism, and the Chinese diaspora. Less formally, but more importantly, many people consider her the foremost scholar of Asian American immigration history. Her enormously important first book, Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens and the Making of Modern America, has been followed by two other profoundly important books, The Lucky Ones, One Family and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America, and The Chinese Question the gold rushes and global politics. That one was recently in 2021. Like Nadine, May's contributions are far more than scholarly, but include consistent activism in support of just immigration and labor policies, anti-racist public policies broadly and more. Professor Nye has written on immigration history and policy for the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, The Nation, Dissent, The Atlantic, others. Before becoming a historian, she was a labor union organizer and an educator in labor studies. And she's now writing Nation of Immigrants, a short history of an idea. I welcome both of our distinguished speakers. And now last but not least, I want to introduce our first speaker, the colleague whose book has brought us all together tonight to learn and celebrate. Manajay Maradian, Assistant Professor in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, 
holds a PhD from New York University. Prior to joining us at Barnard in 2018, Menage held positions as President's Postdoctoral Fellow in Asian American Studies at UC Davis, was a visiting scholar in the Center for the Study of Sexuality and Gender at NYU, and was an Andrew Mellon Fellow in Comparative Revolutions in the Department of History at Brandeis. That's my favorite title. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I thought my title was good, but that's way better. Okay. Manage's work as a transnational feminist scholar centers on the study of Iran and its multiple diasporas, which she engages through queer and feminist cultural studies, American studies, Asian American studies, as well as Iranian and Middle East studies. Her highly interdisciplinary training is visible throughout her beautiful first book, The Flame, This Flame Within, Iranian Revolutionaries in the United States, which has just been released by Duke University Press, and you can buy here tonight, I believe. <laughs> Using a truly impressive range of archival and interview sources, The Flame Within, I think the, the title, it, it, yeah. okay, I, I knew it was this, This Flame Within, thank you, tells the fascinating and important story of the involvement of Iranian international students in radical student movements of the 1960s and 70s, including the civil rights, anti-war and third world movements, which they connected to anti-imperialist efforts in Iran. Two of the many contributions of this book are that it challenges both the typical narrative of leftist failure and complicity in the rise of the post-1979 Islamist government and the, uh, the erasure of the women's uprising of 1979, which was the first in instance of mass resistance against the new regime. I won't say any more about the book because we have actual <laughs> experts on hand to do that. <laughs> but I will say that Menage's work as a scholar and an activist in the Iranian di diaspora has made her a sought after and incisive commentator on the current feminist uprising in Iran. We couldn't be happier or more proud to have Manajay as a colleague. So without further ado, please welcome her as she provides comments on the book. Wow, this is harder than I thought. I don't like being the center of attention. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, thanks to everyone at BCRW, especially our co-directors, uh, Pamela and Addison and Janet Jacobson, and to all of my colleagues. I have the best colleagues in the world. Janet, Beck, Elizabeth, Nefertiti, Marissa. Um, I just uh, couldn't have made it this far without you. And my heartfelt gratitude to May and Nadine for being here with me tonight um, to, to have this conversation. Um, so I put the finishing touches on this book um, during a time of political despair. Um, we were at a historical impasse 40 years into a US-Iran conflict, right, in which these two nations, albeit with very unequal spheres of power, um, have been positioning themselves as polar opposites on the world stage, and yet both responsible for policies that systematically make life worse and worse for ordinary Iranian people. Not only were we four decades into this standoff, but efforts to change conditions in Iran had hit a dead end with the crushing of reform movements more than a decade ago. And we saw protests in 2017 and 2019 were swiftly suppressed with tremendous state violence. So there was this sense of hopelessness, of history at a dead end. Um, and anyone who could leave Iran was desperately trying to do so. Um, this of course is in a larger context of the rise of right-wing authoritarianism and fundamentalisms globally on top of decades of neoliberalism and regionally it's been quite a devastating landscape um, with the backlash of military dictatorship and war unleashed against Arab revolutions of 10 years ago, round after round of Zionist settler and state violence against Palestinians and the victory of the Taliban in Afghanistan coming after decades of US occupation and destruction there. Um, so this is sort of the, <laughs> the, the era, right, that I'm writing in, into with the book and in Iran, the word revolution was a, was a corrupted word. It belonged to the state that ruled in its name. Um, and I, as I was writing into this bleakness, I was arguing that memories of revolutionary hope and possibility are a vital inheritance we can and must learn from. They form an archive of history's roads not taken that nonetheless remind us that things could have been and still can be otherwise. In the book, I argue that the memories, affects, and emotions of Iranian student leftists who built a transnational movement 
against U.S. support for the Shah can be a source of inspiration as well as critique. The book focuses on the Iranian Students Association, which was the U.S. affiliate of the Confederation of Iranian Students, and the organizing they did to make the Iranian freedom struggle part and parcel of the era of third world internationalism and part of the radical student left in the US as well. Um, one of the biggest lessons of the book written in anticipation of the next round of revolutionary upheaval was that the next time it has to be feminist. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank goodness nobody waited around for my book, okay? Suddenly we find ourselves in the midst of a new Iranian revolution that is decidedly feminist in character. Iranian women are literally using their bodies to try to push through the historical impasse that I described a moment ago, through the political dead end of patriarchal authoritarianism as the price Iranians are supposed to pay for national sovereignty, of religious fundamentalism as authentic national culture and supposedly the only alternative to Western domination. We see a rejection of the imperial and nationalist binaries that have been used to control and subjugate women, but really all Iranian people and a huge historical leap towards new concepts and forms of subjectivity encapsulated in the Kurdish feminist slogan, women, life, freedom. So one of the key, so this is now like we're in a different historical moment, okay, than when I finished the book. Um, but one of the key questions that I ask in the book is about the processes through which large numbers of people become revolutionaries at certain times and places. And I think the framework that I offer in the book um, is really quite useful for this, this, new, this new historical moment um, as well. The book elaborates an affective theory of revolutionary subjectivity. And by affect, I mean the accumulation of lived experiences as bodily intensities, right? That are filled with potential and indeterminacy, energies that can be channeled into different political directions and worldviews. So in my interviews for the book with 30 former ISO, I, ISA members, um, one of whom is here tonight. <laughs> Honor. Um, in these interviews, I, I, um, you know, I, among many of the stories that came out, um, when I asked people, you know, how did you become political? Like, why did you decide to devote your life to making a revolution? Very often, I listened to childhood memories of repression and resistance in Iran under the U.S.-backed Shah, memories that were formative and that traveled with these young people when they came to the US to study. I developed the concept of revolutionary affects to make sense of how it happened that a minority among a very privileged group of middle and upper class Iranian students, you know, who were able to study abroad in that period, how it came to be that they decided to toss aside the status and wealth that would have come with a Western degree and a lucrative career back in Iran and reorient their lives towards making a revolution. So the concept of revolutionary affects refers to the sensorial material out of which a revolutionary consciousness can later be fashioned and to those affects that attach to and fuel the project of making a revolution. I argue that the revolutionary affects of former ISA members were forged through encounters with police state repression and resistance in Iran meaning the lived experience of a US-backed dictatorship, as well as the global context of anti-colonial and anti-racist organizing that was permeating US society as well by the late 1960s. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the 1960s and 1970s, third world Marxism offered Iranian student activists a method of reading their for these formative memories and the affects that remained, a way of interpreting um, those uh, experiences and affects, you know, that they were carrying around with them, right? Um, at that time, there were organizations, ideologies, leaders, and parties that became sites of affective attachment for these young people that offered a language through which to articulate their revolutionary desires. 
Today, not just in Iran, but in many places, those ideologies have been largely discredited by the dictatorships that they supported um, and by, of course, intense state repression that has prevented the formation of new parties and organizations. Yet still, in the absence of all of that, people are moved to revolt. Masa Jina Amini's killing ignited the revolutionary affects of millions of Iranian women. And for the first time in Iranian history, men too have been moved to act en masse against the state's repression of women. Stored within all of those bodies is a record of fear, humiliation, and anger that is not bounded by any ideology or party line or leaders' pronouncements. The affective archive of lived experience in the Islamic Republic has generated a collective desire for revolution so powerful it has enabled people to overcome fear and to fight for a different Iran in the face of horrific state violence. The power of revolutionary affects alone might not overthrow the state, but the transformation of millions of young people into feminist revolutionaries is already a massive victory. In many ways, the uprising in Iran today is a vindication of the women's uprising in Tehran in March 1979. So in the book, I analyze the gender and sexual politics of the Iranian Students Association as a case study of third world <coughs> leftist groups of that era. I write about how the gender and sexual politics of the Iranian diasporic student left ended up pushing some women towards feminism while orienting the majority of ISA members towards a very hierarchical concept of freedom, which was dominant at the time, um, and which basically stipulated that the, the primary contradiction in society, or that the first priority was um, you know, about imperialism, was, was securing the revolution against imperialism. That was the number one priority. And issues like equal rights for women and ethnic minorities were, were secondary um, at best, or divisive and counter-revolutionary at worst. Um, and this is not unique to Iran, but it's, a, it's an important case study. Um, in a critical chapter of the book, I write about an uprising of thousands of women in Tehran on March 8th, International Women's Day in 1979. And this was in the immediate aftermath of the overthrow of the Shah and before the formation of the Islamic Republic government. This women's uprising posed the first open challenge to the consolidation of Islamist power, expressing a gendered form of revolutionary affects that was not widely shared at the time. These were women who were part of making the revolution, part of overthrowing the Shah, and who were just as committed to uh, the revolutionary remaking of society as any male revolutionary. However, their desires for full equality threatened the masculinist forms of revolutionary politics that dominated. And this was true among most of the left as well as liberal nationalists and Islamists. The majority of Iranian society was not moved and did not join these women when they objected to the government's earliest efforts to impose hijab by force. The women who rose up were disparaged as bourgeois, as westernized, as recklessly endangering the unity of the revolution over something as simple as a piece of cloth. Their main argument that the imposition of compulsory hijab was not only oppressive to women, but was a sign of broader authoritarian tendencies was dismissed. These women stood at the intersection of imperialism and Islamism and tried to expose the collusion between the two, the connections between the lack of women's rights and the lack of democracy, this sort of hollowing out of the meaning of freedom that people had been fighting for. This movement expressed what I call an intersectional anti-imperialism, a politics opposed to the intersecting structures of patriarchal authoritarianism coming from the Shah's westernizing dictatorship and from the nation Islamist leadership. This integrated analysis defied the binary logics of West versus Islam that continue to shape the current era of US-Iran relations and that too often distort feminism, even among the Iranian diaspora today, into a pro-US interventionist position. However, in Iran today, the idea that compulsory hijab is inseparable from all of the other ways that the Islamic Republic exercises unjust power is the starting point for the revolution underway. We might understand what is happening in Iran as the accumulation of the revolutionary affects of the women of March 8, 1979, and really all of the Iranian women who have found ways large and small to resist under the Western backed Shah and under the Islamic Republic. For those of us here in the US, the book offers a window into a very different way of thinking about Iran and the long Iranian freedom struggle. 
over 100 years now in its modern form. Um, and really thinking about Iran, not as a place that is the ultimate other to the West, but as a site of connection um, among many liberation movements. One of the most important contributions the book makes is uncovering the history of joint organizing that Iranian student activists engaged in throughout the 1960s and 1970s. And more of my comrades are arriving. Push <laughs> um, <laughs> Um <clears throat> When I was conducting archival research, I kept finding evidence of Iranian anti-Shah activists in unlikely places, like the front lines of the San Francisco State Strike, 1968-69, or the pages of the Black Panther newspaper, or um, organizing and marching for a free Palestine, chanting slogans in Arabic and getting beaten up because people thought they were Palestinians, right? Um, <laughs> ISA members holding joint meetings with students for a democratic society, marching against the war in Vietnam. So in the book, I write about how Iranians came to be involved in these and other movements that ostensibly had nothing directly to do with US policy in Iran. I theorize the concept of affects of solidarity to explain how the revolutionary affects of different populations, and, and I mean different in the sense of how they were raced and gendered, but also how they were slotted into an American, American imperial world order, right, during the Cold War era, how these, how these revolutionary affects overlapped and combined to create affective attachments to the liberation of others. So I'll just share an example that is where the title of the book comes from. Sorry, one second. So one of the people I interviewed um, who actually lives in Iran, and I only met him because if people remember, there was something called Occupy Wall Street. Um, <laughs> and some people are actually here who I met at Occupy Wall Street. But anyway, um, um, Jalil Mostashari was visiting his son who lives in New York. And of course there was you know, a movement. So there he was right at the center of it. That's where I met him, Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park. Um, and he had been an ISA member in the mid 1960s in East Lansing, Michigan. Um, and I had the opportunity to interview him about his memories. And he was just, he was like one of the first people I interviewed very, very early in this process. Um, and he was talking about his student activist days in the US in this very matter of fact way. Right? He was like, you know, oh yeah, I was a member of the NAACP and I was a member of the Muslim Student Association. I was, and he said, um, he said, you know, the black struggle was part of the total international struggle for me. And it was not only them, sometimes the UAW, United Auto Workers, uh, you know, sometimes they needed people on their picket lines in Detroit. So, you know, we went there and when Arab students had an action, we would participate in it. Uh, when we had an action, they would participate in it. Eritreans would come with us. Afghan students would come would come with us. Some people from Bengal, they were leftists, they would come with us. And I'm just listening to them, you know. And so I asked him, you know, what motivated this such a high level of commitment? I mean, you were in like 20 organizations <laughs> that had nothing to do with Iran, right? Um, and he looked me in the eyes, held my gaze, and spoke with the gravity of someone expressing a sacred truth. Quote. If you want people to sympathize with you, you have to sympathize with them at the time of their need. You cannot just say things. You've got to believe it really in your heart. You have to have this flame within you that can warm others. You cannot say it with your tongue. It doesn't move anybody. So I extrapolate from this, you know, um, this, this affective theory of solidarity. Um, and and I, it really, for me, became clear that um, more than any ideology or party line, um, it was really these affects of solidarity that animated the era of third world internationalism. You know, when we look back and we think of that high point of, um, of, of, of solidarity, we, I think we, we really miss something if we don't pay attention to the way people really became affectively attached to other people's freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So that when the U.S. was lost in Vietnam and the Vietnamese people won in Vietnam, Iranians were cheering that it was like a victory for them. You know, that's really how they felt, like at the level of the body, you know, that is how they experienced it as a victory for them as well. Um, and so this is also the, the context that gives rise to third world feminisms. And this is really the, the, the history that I'm trying to situate um, Iranian women within, within this larger process of women's participation in revolutionary anti-colonial movements and their experiences 
of gender and sexual oppression within society at large, but also within those movements that produces new forms of feminism, right? That produces mm -hmm. third world feminism and that Iranians are part of that global process, part of that genealogy. Um, this history shows, I think, uh, the history of, of, of affects of solidarity, of Iranian uh, cross-pollination and joint organizing with other movements. It, I think it does show what's possible, um, but I also want to acknowledge that it's much harder today um, to, to have Iran become that kind of site of affective attachment for others, mm -hmm. or to have Iranians feel the same kind of investment in other liberation movements. It's much harder today. And this is um, because of, there are many factors, but I think two key ones are because of the way that the Islamic Republic has co-opted the discourse of anti-imperialism and used it to crush internal dissent. Mm -hmm. um, and also because of course, of the systematic demonization, sanctioning and othering of Iran in and by the US. Um, so, we in the Iranian diaspora, those of us in the Iranian diaspora, I think we have a lot to learn from the legacy of the ISA um, and their work supporting and identifying with so many other freedom movements. And I think we really must learn from the rejection of sort of both sides of that West versus East binary that emerged on the streets of Tehran in March 1979. I think the same way people in Iran are reclaiming the word revolution right now from the regime, we here in the US have to reclaim anti-imperialism yeah. as a crucial part of transnational feminist practice mm -hmm. and as a necessary starting point for a new era of affects of solidarity, right? Because I think an international intersectional anti-imperialism counters that hierarchical anti-imperialism um, of, of the kind of anti-colonial eras of, of the past and really rejects all forms of domestic and foreign oppression. Moreover, this framework, an intersectional anti-imperialist framework, opens up the possibility of resituating the movement for freedom in Iran within a larger global context of liberation movements against US empire, settler colonialism, and religious and secular dictatorships across borders and hemispheres. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was incredible, incredible, incredible. Maybe you just, you know, take a breath and just honor again, Maniji. I'm sure we all are thinking the same thing, you know, the relevance of the book with everything that's happening and also the, the pain and the, the affect as a, also, you know, Iranian people in the room here today and what everybody's actually going through in this very moment. So I just wanna, this isn't of course just about the past or about um, academic analysis, right? A lot of people are really uh, struggling. So I just wanna just feel that with everybody. So first, and it, I, one thing that, um, so much of what I'm gonna say is so similar to what Manija said. And I find that really powerful and beautiful that I we're, we're we don't know each other so well, but we're we're so like-minded. And I think you'll you'll see that in a moment. So first I just want to commend um Money J on disrupting the way research and activism related to third world liberation movements has tended to bypass Iran, yeah. positioning Iran as an outlier. So let's consider the US federal government's classification of Iranians as white as if Iranians are not impacted by racism or the tendency within US solidarity movements toward crude, that is reactionary or cowardly anti-imperialism in the United States related to the Middle East. We have seen, for example, the idealization of Palestine, which of course, many of you who know me, <laughs> my life is Palestine. So that is of course crucial, but Oftentimes, Palestine is the beginning and end of Middle East politics, which not only sidelines Iran, but enacts a limited anti-imperialism that fails in its accountability to the region, to Palestine's regional reality, um, Israeli settler colonialism's regional um, reality, and how the connection between Palestine and places like Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, the list goes on, Egypt, are essential to the U.S. imperial project, as Manije shows in her book. Relatedly, this crude anti-imperialism remains stuck 
in binarist framings, like the Shah regime is pro-West, post-Shah is anti-West. And we saw this with Iraq, when during the Iraq war, strands of the left insisted that we can criticize the US war, but not Saddam, or limit the critique of Saddam to only how the US contributed to his power. And we saw it with Syria and Assad, whereby some perspectives mm -hmm. treat Assad as anti-imperialist, mm -hmm. but lack a focus on his brutality mm -hmm. or a simple lack of nuance around Syria's local and global realities, historically and politically. We saw it in 2006, Lebanon, when the US backed Israeli bombing was framed, um, was challenged, but little attention to the central issue for the left in Lebanon, which is the struggle to end sectarianism. Mm -hmm. To be fair, of course, U.S. left these trends um, struggle around questions, you know, fair enough, like how do we critique internal conflicts in these, you know, this region without reifying imperialism and racism? How do we critique Assad without reinforcing U.S. empire? Or the feminist question, how do we critique sexism and homophobia in Arab and Muslim communities without reifying Arab bashing and Islamophobia? And as Manija shows in her work, this problem justifies the silencing of critiques of sexism, um, as Manija shows, and justifies repressing revolutionary critiques of authoritarian regimes, and in many ways parallels imperial discourses of clash of civilizations. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we have um, this issue gets reified and. Uh, replayed among MENA diasporas, um, where we silence ourselves, as Manije teaches us when she writes the dia about the diasporic mandate to only criticize the US government, um, and that how that's driven by the legitimate fear that saying anything negative about Iranian society can and will be used as a justification for sanctions, war, and US-sponsored regime change. But as she explains, who benefits from this silence? the Iranian regime that justifies both its existence and its repression of resistance through the rhetoric of anti-imperialism with blood on its hands. So while it might be easier for us, um, meaning critical fields like gender and women's studies, et cetera, to leave it alone, um, that is the internal politics, um, it, we, we have already assumed in our work, theoretically at least, that there is no meta narrative of liberation, as Ella Shohat writes, or that the politics of any context in the global South are more complex than an either pro or anti imperialist stance. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, we assume this, but what happens when we approach the Middle East region? The flame within does not only fill a lacuna though by adding Iran to you know, complex analyses um, about third world liberation, but it helps us resolve these difficult challenges mm -hmm. through what Manije calls a diasporic Iranian feminist critique or diasporic Iranian, sorry, did I say it right? <laughs> okay, where am yeah. I here? Okay, um, by centering leftist Iranian movements in the diaspora, she conceptualizes diaspora in ways that collapse time-space distinctions between homeland and diaspora, pre and post Iranian revolution. And she challenges the reduction of the Iranian diaspora to pro Shah politics, to the, you know, what, what she mentioned, the pre post um, binary of, you know, pro West, anti West. And she blurs the binaries of, um, between this position. And as she puts it, um, she, re um, what she's doing is uplifting many of the continuities between the pre and post revolutionary periods, um, especially in terms of how they've been overlooked in ways that may distort our understanding of diasporic consciousness and political possibility. And she importantly blurs, and I wanna uplift this, the religious versus secular divide that, um, and the example that she gave about Jalil, which I have the same exact example, but yeah, she's yeah. talking about the, uh, the she talks, this uh, activist who she refers to, who was, you know, in all those groups, was a communist who was the leader of the Islamic Students Association. <laughs> um, so we see this leftist continuity, 
right? Uh, um, before and after the fall of the Shah, but also not in the rigid secular sense that also limits US left analyses. So I really appreciated her narration of Jalil's story. Um, I don't know if I'm referring to the same person, but the chairman of the Muslim Student yes, Association yes. at Michigan State, mm -hmm. who says, what does solidarity in this case have to do with religion? He's from a Muslim family, but becomes a communist as a teenager. And it really reminded me of misunderstandings within US scholarship that fail to conceptualize the mutual relationality between Islamism and say Arab nationalism. Um, so we can think then of Arab nationalism, how it, it, it's often reduced in US discussions as if it's strictly secular in the European or US sense. Um, and so Manisha envisions um, an Iranian revolution in which religious and secular women's demands for equality were seen as the legitimate extension of each other, of each other's desire for freedom. And she affirms the variety of ideas, tactics, and practices of Iranian feminists to challenge patriarch patriarchy and imperialism, again, beyond this religious versus secular feminist divide. So through her insistence on what we could call a critical contextual anti-imperialist analysis, she affirms that not all Iranian anti-imperialism is you know, either one or the other. And the way she maps leftist Iranian continuity pre and post the, the Shah period, especially disrupts this crude anti-imperialism, she writes, at this bleak moment, it is all the more important to recuperate a history of thousands of young Iranians who imagined and even glimpsed a future for Iran that was neither a monarchist client state nor a theocratic dictatorship. And then she has the methodology of possibility that allows us to claim the mistakes as much as the success says, as part of a critical diasporic inheritance for future generations to parse and transform. Her feminist analysis here then crucially expands anti-imperialist feminist critique. And she maps a capacious Iranian diasporic feminist politics that challenges simultaneously US imperial pretensions to saving Muslim women, the repressive policies and attitudes regulating gender and sexuality in Iran. And as she just discussed the repressive policies and attitudes regulating gender and sexuality in the United States. She uses a feminist, and I would add, queer concept of diaspora to accomplish this, and maybe drawing on Gayatri Gopinath as well here, where her feminist and queer critique disrupts the hierarchy of the authentic home versus the inauthentic diaspora that can reify the pressure to critique US imperialism while remaining silent over internal issues like authoritarianism or sexism. In other words, the flame within provides a way out of the diasporic bind that cr to critique violence launched by colonized people reifies imperialism. I also wanna uplift her innovative approach to diaspora whereby what inspires diasporic connection and belonging is not necessarily conventional, a conventional diasporic sense of longing for home or the experience of becoming scattered which both reinforce the authentic, inauthentic divide, homeland diaspora. But as she puts it, it is their affective memories of encounters with state repression, dictatorship and empire, and, it, and their collective resistance that inspires diasporic sense of belonging. Um, and in doing so, then she places West Asia and North Africa on the map of third world liberation activist concerns linking domestic and imperial forms of subjugation. So in the flame within, we see a sense of diasporic belonging that emerges when people live within a nation at war with their homeland. What I have called diaspora of empire, um, here in the flame within, empire inscri inscribes itself on the diasporic subject within the domestic national borders of empire. So analyzing US imperialism from the location of Iranian diaspora opens up crucial possibilities. For example, it opens up possibilities to consider Iranians experiences with war and repression at home with migration struggles in the United States and helps us understand how military violence 
and what takes place within the geographic boundaries of, of the empire magnify each other and are moving parts of the same imperial presence. In this sense, the flame within refuses the imperialist analytic tendency to spatially and geographically separate the impact of US-led empire from the realities of life in the US. And resisting US empire then in its local and global forms necessitates reframing time and space, which is what her book does. It all happens together, even if in different locations. Which leads me to um, another point, what is it, which I found especially powerful about the book is that while diaspora studies takes up communities um, living in the US with solidarities elsewhere, the flame within diaspora emerges against the highly invasive and shifting relations of power within and beyond US borders. So Manijé expands how scholars and activists analyze maybe what we could, um, uh, what we should talk about joint struggle or coalitional anti-imperialism. She shows how Iranian diasporic affiliations with other racialized populations are a vital part of the history of Iranians in the United States. And is there, um, and she specifically theorizes the everyday practices that made third world internationalism into something lived and felt, a way of being in the world in relation to others. So one of the book's then major contributions uh, uh, is her analytic that she discussed, Affects of Solidarity. Um, so maybe I'll skip because you just defined it. Um, uh, but I wanna maybe uplift this idea of solidarity generated when revolutionary desires for revolution, as she writes, circulate and converge across different populations and movements. And I was particularly inspired by how many Jay's analytic, the affects of solidarity, allows her to map the coalitions Iranian leftists joined with the Black Panther Party, the struggle against the Vietnam War and Palestinian liberation. In her analysis, affective attachments to the liberation of others expand coalitions and solidarities. So maybe something that you didn't mention as much is how these affective solidarities expand the possibilities for coalition and inspire broader and broader connections. So we then see the expansion to struggles in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Jordan, um, and beyond. And that was in her discussion of US weapon sales. So by analyzing shared affective responses to injustice and the circulation of the desire for freedom across borders, Manije reveals how the influence of transnational and diasporic anti-colonial movements play a key role in protests previously considered as merely domestic. And that's one of the big interventions, right? Is um, showing the uh, global extension of what's often defined as um, some of the domestically focused movements of that time. So indeed the significance of the flame within extends far beyond this period though, um, and beyond Iran today. I, I wanna also uplift the, how the forever war of terror, mutually reinforced by a proliferation of police violence and killings um, in the United States, you know, that the analysis of the US war on terror justifies the militarization of police and the ever expanding military industrial complex, the violent repression of social movements that we're seeing, um, the catastrophic climate crisis and mass displacement of people from their indigenous lands. So just bringing the book to today, um, but also, you know, how the book, I'm, I'm now going into how the book might be useful for these issues, and I promise I'm wrapping up, is that um, US social movement coalitions connecting these phenomena, as we may have seen the, year the years following September 11th have dwindled. So what I'm saying is post September 11th, we saw an anti-imperialist anti coalitions. And I'm saying that we are now in a moment of sort of domestic even in the way some in some of the ways abolition is um, you know mobilized um, as if there is a domestic and a and a global again. So I would argue that the flame within affirms the possibilities of capacious anti-imperialist and anti-racist coalitions necessary for undoing the social landscape productive of empire. So we might, for instance, ask how Manige's analysis can help us expand our analysis of the permeable relationality between the prison industrial complex mm -hmm. and the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. In Manige's analysis, coalitional consciousness is more than solidarity. 
um, which you know can hinge on and reify <laughs> an analysis of separate structures of violence um, and can contribute to the bifurcation of social movements and limit the potential of our collective survival. Manije's analysis of affective solidarities as animating energies that move people towards others with whom they see sense something shared, as she writes, is especially crucial as the US empire works hard to separate inherently conjoined struggles. But when we consider them together as the flame within does, um, we then affirm the interdwined strands of the US's imperial project. But the US understands the threat to its empire catapults when movements across borders converge. So we could, for example, apply affective anti-imperialist solidarity, her analytic, to understand the reproductive injustice and act of war that took place in <clears throat> Oakland, California in January 2020 when the Alameda County Sheriff's Department used military-grade tanks and weapons to raid and evict houseless mothers and babies from their home where they were staying or the ways the militarized criminalization of resistance has intensified with the trumped up charges, protracted legal battles and conflation of resistance to state violence with terrorism, like the charges against folks from the Movement for Black Lives are facing. Um, the collaboration between immigration control, US prisons and the war on terror, as we saw with the case of Palestinian Rasmiya Odeh, who was incarcerated by the Israeli state in 1967, and then in 2017 brought, um, had deportation charges against her. She was arrested for immigration fraud through a US prosecutor who portrayed her as a terrorist with a jury that you, and together the prosecutor used Israeli produced and fabricated documents. And then she was incarcerated in a US woman's prison in Detroit before she was deported to Jordan and continues to be, not, to not be denied access to her homeland in Palestine. So indeed, Manijay's contention that freedom is a practice that necessitates anti-imperialism indeed is more urgent than ever before. Thank you. Wow, okay. Uh, thanks to uh, Janet and Beck um, and Manijay. I'm delighted to be here to see such a turn out for this wonderful scholar and this wonderful book. And Nadine, thank you for those comments too. Um, I confess I come to this. I'm not quite sure you, why you, I'm not quite sure why you invited me because I'm a bit of an outsider to your world here. And I've learned so much just from the book and from tonight. Um, but maybe an outsider's perspective might raise some other questions that we can think about along with those um, raised by our experts. Uh, so thank you, Manage, for this wonderful book uh, that I read with great pleasure and profit and obviously so timely, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, I guess I was thinking about, I was looking over my notes and I was sort of listening to you, your brilliant um, analysis. And I guess mine is a little bit more historical, so I'm gonna yeah. just do that. I so, hear. <laughs> so, um, so I was really struck by one of your uh, interviewees, uh, Sina, who yeah. said, it was our age in a double sense, the age at which we were and the age in which we were. Mm -hmm. And she, she talks about this connection that took place at the time between um, the optimism and energy of young people at a historical moment in which those students happen to be young. Mm -hmm. At that age and in that age, a collective subject was produced and reproduced through the work of organizing, protesting, publishing newspapers, as well as through quotidian and intimate details of daily life. This especially resonated with me because I was also a radical activist in the 1970s, <laughs> part of this same double age, and I'm not gonna talk about myself. <laughs> but coincidentally, um, in the same vein, last week I was reading a book about the United Farm Workers and the Chicano movement in the 1970s, which in this book, this author similarly stressed the transformative nature of that age, and especially for the young student activists the experience of being in radical politics and social movements at that time was indeed transformative, um, as Manager argues, 
uh, for the subject formation of a whole generation for identities that have had long after lives um, after the revolutionary fervor subsided. And this is what she theorizes as revolutionary affects. So thank you for that. That insight goes rather far in answering one of the first questions she poses at the beginning of the book. How was it that militant and anti-imperialist activists emerged from the ranks of privileged foreign students whose raison d'etre was to assist in the modernization of Iran under the Shah's regime? And how did they come to align themselves with such a wide range of liberation movements? I did not know that Iranians were the single largest group of foreign students in the United States during the Cold War, upwards of 80,000 between 1966 and 1977. Uh, I learned from the book that this was a formation of a, what she calls an imperial model minority, part of US imperialism strategy to educate elites of its allies in the third world for de developmental and geopolitical purposes. Um, I want to add to Nadine's um, brilliant uh, exposition on diaspora um, to think about foreign students in particular as a diasporic population. Mm -hmm. Viewed from abroad in a new context, uh, in new context of both local and global politics, the homeland starts to look different. Mm -hmm. This view from without engenders new perspectives and new critiques. And there are new influences as well, shaped by the contingencies of time and place. In an earlier double age, the 1910s, the age of war and revolution in the early 20th century, Vietnamese students in Paris became communists. Chinese students in Japan became anarchists. The Chinese students in the United States became liberals. But... <laughs> in the post-World War II era of decolonization, the Cold War and Third World Liberation, foreign students from Third World countries critiqued U.S. support for the corrupt and repressive dictatorships that oppressed their countrymen and women at home. To say that foreign students are part of the diaspora is to recognize that they are not just temporarily away at school, but that they enter into homeland politics actually directly, even if they are far away from home. When domestic repression is repressed, those in diasporic communities are often the only voices and they can be impactful, especially when their voices are raised in the belly of the beast. When the Shah of Iran jailed, censored, outlawed, and assassinated his political opponents, the ISA was the only legal opposition to the Shah from 1963 to 1971 when it too was banned. Now, I don't have to tell you this, Americans are general are in general are ignorant of the world. Let's face it, we learned about Vietnam because we were in a war there. But who knew anything about Iran? save for the Iranian students who publicized the atrocities of the Shah, students who showed up at, to protest every time he was awarded an honorary degree at an American university, an astounding number of degrees. She, she counts close to a dozen, mostly from elite institutions, including Columbia, <laughs> as if these academic robes could sanitize him and elevate him as a cultured and civilized man. And to me, it suggests in this very small, you know, way, but it suggests the geopolitical stakes for the United States um, in the Middle East and how much they were invested in prop, not just propping up, but in idealizing the Shah. But because we knew about Vietnam, we then also learned about and built our solidarities with Cuba, with Mozambique, with China, against the Shah, against Marcos in the Philippines, against Papadoc in Haiti. This was the age, the age of third world liberation, which transformed young people, especially with a vision that we could be part of a world that was going, undergoing revolutionary change. And we could be a part of that change. We could contribute to that change. And that's what Manage so brilliantly uh, helps us understand as the affects of solidarity. And I just wanna say, I was, I'm working on this book project um, of the Asian American movement. And in the 1970s, um, I came up, I found this photograph of, um, the Iwar Kuhn or IWK storefront in Chinatown where I was an activist in 1971. And in the storefront in Chinatown where 
three members of the Black Panther Party celebrating International Workers Day with a banner for, um, of the red, the, the red sun rising in the east and a portrait of Chairman Mao in the background. So yeah. that was um, a very recent uh, uh, discovery of mine, a, a reminder of these aspects of solidarity. Mm -hmm. When the Shah was finally overthrown and the revolutionary government came to power, many of the leftist students abroad returned to Iran, heady with its vict this victory against US imperialism and determined to be a part of the new society. Manage is careful to resist the narrative that, Islamic, that the Islamic fundamentalists led by Khomeini hijacked the revolution or to read the Islamic Republic as a tragic inevitability in the binary struggle between secularism and religion, in other words, um, between the enlightened West and the despotic East. She offers a way out of this teleology with an approach that she aptly calls the, the method of possibility. This is brilliant in my view because it's an analytic of historical contingency. Was there another path and why was that path not taken? Um, nobody's mentioned this so far, so I'm going, I'm very pleased to point out <laughs> that she has a brilliant analysis of a video um, of the women's uprisings in March of 1979 um, made by French activists who were in Tehran at the time. And that video, I think, really shows um, that there was this crucial moment of possibility when what was, what would happen, it was not ordained or knowable even. And I recommend that you watch this video. It's not that long, you can see it on YouTube. It's amazing. There were massive protests of women in the streets, tens of thousands of women, triggered by the government's ruling that women working in government office, offices were required to wear a hijab, but also articulate of broader demands of women's equal, for women's equality in all spheres of life. The women made clear they did not participate in the revolution against the Shah, only to be put in second-class status by the revolution. In the film, there seems to be a preponderance of younger women with their heads uncovered, but there is a substantial presence of women in hijab, middle-aged and older women, and working-class women. The French filmmakers do not pause to analyze the meaning of this incredible cross-section of Iranian women. Mm -hmm. they you can see them, but they tend to focus more on the educated, especially those who speak French or English. They also elide visuals and discussion of violence that was taking place um, at the moment, right, against the women protesters. Mm -hmm. The filmmakers show that something extraordinary is happening, but their analysis seems circumscribed by their own Western gaze. This powerful out pouring of the women forced the government to rescind its order that female workers had to wear a hijab at government offices. But that concession would soon itself be rescinded and the required covering of women's bodies was extended to all public spaces in Iran. But in that moment of protest and concession, uh, Manajay identifies a moment of possibility that the eventual outcome was not preordained. The tragedy within the tragedy perhaps um, is that the leaders of the left, the Iranian left, including many of the students who went back, did not take seriously enough the demands of the women, uh, even misread and doubted them as pawns of imperialism. Manage does not argue that the Iranian left was strong enough to have necessarily altered the ultimate course of events, but it is, I think, a bit of an open question, and it's something we can really think about, about you know, what are the conditions of possibility at any given time? She suggests that the left was itself constrained by the same binaries of secular versus religion um, and that they just flip flop from one side to the other. This moment of possibility and the error of the left suggests to us that the centrality of gender in Iranian struggle. And I don't, I don't mean gender particularly in as part of intersectional identities or intersectional analysis. I mean that the woman question, and I'm OG, so that's yeah. an older Marxian term, <laughs> but that the woman question is central to the struggle for democracy. Yeah. And we ignore this at our peril. We see this today in the United States where the elimination of reproductive rights for women is at the leading edge of authoritarianism. And of course in Iran today where women 
have led the new uprising against the regime. Mm -hmm. um, I confess I'm, I'm here to learn a lot more about that and I look forward to more discussion. Um, and I, I wanna end with a kind of historian's question is, um, you know, what, what are the lines of continuity and discontinuity between the uh, ISA and the revolutionary uh, activism of the 70s and what we see today? Um, is there, uh, you know, it's 50 years later, it's a new generation. So what has been the course of feminism during that time? Um, I'm really curious what the development of women's activism and thinking and politics has been in Iran in this last this last 50 years or even this last 10 years, this period of bleakness that you talk about that, you know, you, when, when things are bleak, it doesn't mean people aren't thinking mm -hmm. right? <laughs> or talking with each other, right? I mean, in China now, they're holding up pieces of blank paper, mm -hmm. right? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so I'm really, I'm interested in kind of, his, maybe if we can historicize this concept of the afterlife mm -hmm. of revolutionary ethics and revolutionary mm -hmm. solidarities. Mm -hmm. How do we trace the lines of continuity, uh, but also disjuncture what's new today yeah. and what produced what's new? what carried the old, I think we can we can sense what carried the old, right? Yeah. The 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 afterlife of revolution. But what accounts for the new? That's my question. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Should we open it up or yes. should and you know yeah. what I actually yeah. I would love it if you would say to May why I mean, we were talking earlier about why May it mm -hmm. is, in fact, a great voice to be in here, because I think it would be a nice just additional situating of, of her comments and her presence. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm I think part of it is because as a historian of Asian migration, immigration to the U.S., I am trying to um, bring Iranians into that larger picture of Cold War migration. Mm -hmm. that, right. So like that's yeah. the, that's the root of it. That's the core of it. Um, um, and and I appreciate your comments so much. I mean, I think your last question in particular is one that many people here are 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 we're we can answer this collectively because I think it's a, no for real because because I think um the, I mean maybe I'll just briefly uh, and then open it up because I I think that in in some ways the story of you know the Iranian left or the modern Iranian freedom struggle is like each generation like sort of tries and gets crushed. Mm -hmm. And the next generation tries not to repeat the mistakes mm -hmm. of the previous generation, <laughs> right? So the, the generation that is the ISA, they are learning from the mistakes of the Tude party, the mm -hmm. communist party of the generation before them that was um, sort of following a Soviet line in a way that came before really prioritizing um, the, the struggle within Iran, right? So if the Tuda party was Stalinist and top down and, and, and not accountable or really responsive to local Iranian conditions, the next generation adopts a kind of third world Marxism, right? So that's, mm -hmm. so, the, and then that generation is sort of, you know, destroyed. And some of the key lessons that emerge are exactly what you said about the women, the women question, right? Is that you can't separate the, you know, um, the broader authoritarianism, the broader dictatorial, uh, you know, regime from its, its gender politics, its sexual politics, and also its treatment of ethnic and religious minorities, which I didn't focus on as much, but it's a key, key part of it. And so, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I do think as a shorthand in the US, thinking about this as an intersectional feminism is useful because it's not simply women saying we want more rights as women, mm -hmm. right? It's about saying we have to actually um, connect this to all the different axes of oppression um, and we, we wanna get rid of the, com the regime completely. So, so I think that, I think that um, you know, this generation has learned from the mistakes of the, of the past, absolutely. And I, and I think that, um, uh, you know, it's 43 years of Islamic Republic. So within that are many stages and phases mm -hmm. of women's organizing, of women's movements. The last 10 years, I mean, people can weigh in on this, have been particularly harsh in the sense that so many women who were activists in Iran had to leave, you know? So we really did see a kind of mass exodus of many of the activists, the organizers, the theorists, you know, have had not everybody, but many, many people had to leave, which means that now in diaspora, mm -hmm. you have um, a tremendous wealth of organizing mm -hmm. uh, experience and deep, deep knowledge of feminist politics that is um, attempting to build new transnational feminist 
uh, networks among among the Iranian diaspora. So the Iranian diaspora is changing too, um, in in really interesting ways. Um, but I think I I, I really I, there's so many people yeah, here who know so much. Yeah. I feel like I want to open it up and also um, acknowledge that um, there's another person here that's in the book, uh, Mike Hare, who's one of the Americans that I interviewed who fondly remembered uh, working with the ISA um, at, at that time. So um, thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so any and all thoughts and questions? <laughs> um, or even just picking up on this last piece about what's different now, right? Um, and yeah. We also invite yeah. invite questions. So yeah. if, you, if you have questions instead of comments. Yes, absolutely. Right right the back. Back. I think in the back, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your research. I really appreciated your analytical kind of endeavor to conceptualize affect as a kind of um, showing the possibilities of transmission between different um, social movements, struggles. And in terms of affect here, I was wondering how would you address kind of the questions of materiality in the sense that uh, so much of technology has changed since 60s and um, so much of Iranian struggle is, ex is happening in US through exposure through let's say Instagram or Facebook. And you, as a, you know, in the examples you were mentioning, it was mostly through interviews, but I heard that was an analysis of the video. So I was wondering mm -hmm how, you know, affect theory and kind of the questions about changing materiality um, kind of plays out and how uh, it kind of challenges continuities between 1960s and like 2020s where, you know, um, again, I was thinking about, you know, how um, uh, materiality can be taught differently today than 1960s. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think, I mean, I think that um, absolutely the technology has changed. I mean, the technology mm -hmm. of the 1979 revolution was the cassette tape, <laughs> right? You know, that people would circulate. And, um, and, and yes, of course, now it's Instagram and the rest of it. But I think um, that that hasn't really, to, to my mind, um, it's, it's maybe accelerated the circulation of, of affect, right? So that we have... I mean, you know, again, we don't, this, what we're seeing in Iran right now is not um, a, a led by an ideology or a party, right? This is so much about an embodied refusal to go along with the status quo. And so all of the tremendous pace of cultural production, songs and images and performances, is, this is all about people wanting to enact through their bodies, you know, the desire for revolution. And then things like social media, become a, a platform where this can can spread like wildfire right and in many ways um and and with lots and lots of tensions um blurs the lines between diaspora and home right and and who, who is producing what for who and who is moving who and how you know how all that's happening i think that it, you know it's it's um it's it's very different than the older technologies where you know you would have a pamphlet in one place and have to smuggle it to another place or something, right? Um, so I think that's a really interesting question. Again, this is all happening. It's unfolding as we speak. So it's really interesting for me to think about how we read affect off of social media and how we are moved. I mean, one really key example is that um, Iranian feminists um, all over the diaspora have been performing the Chilean feminist anthem, The Rapist Is You in, in Persian. Right. And this is a performance. It's incredibly powerful um, that's that's being repeated in city after city, um, you know, by uh, by Iranian feminists. Um, and, and so, you know, again, this is not about signing up for a particular organization or party. Right. This is about affect. It's about I want to do this with my body, you know, and, and I want to be part of this, um, you know, global um, um, kind of feminist solidarity. Um, so that's just one example, you know, and then you can share it on social media so everybody knows who's doing it and then we want to do it too, right? That's how it spreads, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is maybe a dampening counter example. <laughs> what is very in fact inspiring about what's going on in, in Iran now. Um, you know, in the 70s also, you know, the anti-Marcus movement, you know, all of these, it, it came through where it's cassettes, 
uh, music, music cultures that, you know, the transmission of those affects were through music cultures that then that spread even to the middle class from the underground, um, et cetera. But in last year, the son of the dictator was reelected and part of it was the mastery of the social media mm -hmm. platform, mm -hmm. particularly TikTok. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the left now is in, was in a, like a very depressed, mm -hmm. but also, you know, and maybe this is something to think about in the current moment, they felt they neglected that platform. Mm -hmm. They neglected mm -hmm. or that the, uh, that the right, the dictatorship had, you know, 10 years, six years ahead of them um, using, using these platforms and monopolizing. So I just wanted to bring in that, um, mm -hmm. that counter example yeah. uh, that is so recent um, because of, yes, I think, the, I think it's so wonderful how, and I completely agree with the power of the affect in all of these revolutionary movements. Sometimes revolutionaries themselves forget and then they have a story about like why they went and we're like, you were young and you went to the mountains and you know, they yeah. Yeah. An incredible time. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. but they forget that part because then the ideology of sacrifice and all of that stuff. So the affect yeah. part, I think is really, really such a crucial part of the story. But I wanted to offer that counter example of the platforms uh, today and how the right, as we know, even in the United States, mm -hmm has um, very sophisticated, um, you know, strategies, having also learned mm. yeah. from the revolution. Of the mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think all politics are effective politics, right? Everybody is trying to mobilize people's, you know, deep embodied, you know, um, affects and emotions. And, um, and of course, that's part of what I chart is how, um, you know, how people could, could sort of have their desires for revolution attached to what becomes a very authoritarian, you know, regime in Iran, right? And then the aftermath of that, where people have to reckon with, well, how did how did I end up there, you know? Um, and that's one of the kind of devastating legacies, you know, that we're that we're dealing with. But the other thing that reminds me of what you said is that there are people in diaspora right now who want to put the son of the Shah in power in mm -hmm. Iran. So I mean, these things are not over. Right. It's, you know, and there are people, you know, if you go to um, a diasporic protest in the United States, you're going to see people with the monarchist flag waving. Yeah. Right. And so part of, you know, even before these recent events, part of what I'm writing against in the book is that form of diasporic nostalgia. Yeah. Right. And I'm saying, what would it mean if we in diaspora are nostalgic for mm -hmm. the earlier moment? <laughs> <laughs> of solidarity, liberation, revolution, mm -hmm. you know, like we have other options available right. to us of what we can, you know, look to. Um, and, you know, and, and that also for the people who participated as leftists in the ISA, who went home, who tried to be part of this revolution, and obviously it went terribly wrong, and they, they, they fled into exile, they came back. I mean, I tried to emphasize in the book that the people I'm interviewing are survivors. You know, most That's of right. their friends were killed, right? They're the ones who made it out. They end up back in a country that they never wanted to live in, really. Mm -hmm. um, and what are they nostalgic for, for the next decades? <laughs> Not life under the Shah, but that moment of possibility when it could have been otherwise, right? Like that's the kind of, um, what I, I borrow the term from Mariana Hirsch, the resistant nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. That's not folded back into, um, you know, longing for the Shah or the good life of, you know, the Shah or whatever, which was, was kind of the dominant mode of nostalgia uh, since 1979 in the US. But I'm saying, no, there are these leftists here who for them, they're not nostalgic for the Shah, they're nostalgic for that era when, um, you know, when when real social transformation and liberation felt possible, right? Um, so. I just wanna add something. Yes, about, please. Um, yeah. Part of the nostalgia you were talking about and then people in the US where they want uh, Shah, um, as a person who was born in Iran and came to the States uh, 12 years ago, I completely understand and I can't have even conversation with the people who want Shah and had the experience of that life in Iran. What I truly don't understand is hard for me to find an answer for it. Like, how can you live in nostalgia of a person 
and that experience is not yours. Uh -huh. You are leaving the projection uh -huh. of another person, another generation. <laughs> right. Uh, nostalgia. <laughs> oh, I heard, like, how this is even possible. Right. Like, what is happening to the second generation <laughs> that they are pro shot, they love queen, and they want the life that they never had in life. Right. <laughs> so this is my own, you know, I yeah. try to find an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> I mean, most nostalgia is a nostalgia for something that never really existed anyway, right? I mean, but, but really some, <laughs> some people, no, they, they but, had it. Right, right, right. Like, yeah. Yeah, they had a they, they, yeah, they, they lost, lost something. Exactly. They did lose something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were wearing bikini. Yeah. Uh, this right. is part of the things they almost mentioned yeah. at some point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is real. I'm from North Shapiro. I I've watched yeah. it. Yeah, people wore bikinis. It was the Caribbean of the yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's something that people that yeah. they might have lost something? Yeah. 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 Yeah is really really key to, mm. to all of that but yeah yeah, that's, yeah. I, yeah. So I, i'm following up for what you're saying i think um i'm actually very excited to have a but i'm very excited especially because of uh, the um the quote you said in the beginning mm. um because it gives me hope that we can do stuff because I mean, i'll have a separate conversation with you because <laughs> i'm so little uh, sad that when we had an we had an event, uh, there wasn't a lot of Iranians there, but we had a lot of great intersectional, international, transnational, I guess solidarity speakers, but we didn't have uh, many Iranians, so that made me sad. But um, this keeps me hopeful. <laughs> what you just said. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Uh, another thing that I wanted to um, mention is I think. Imperialism in general, anti-imperialism, imperialism is a very difficult topic uh, amongst Iranians, I think, because um, of all these years that imperialism has been the way to suppress yeah. everyone. Exactly. Uh, so I think even I have a, I mean, even, I, I mean, I consider myself anti-imperialist, but I also sometimes have like a physical reaction yeah. even um when i feel like we're being silenced because we have to take like it's it's a way to silence the um you know anti like talking about the islamic republic's uh suppression so mm -hmm. so it's always used as if we are doomed and damned in the in like and i don't mean we i mean people in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, most people in the Middle East are as if it's, they're damned uh, to live that life mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. what it is. Even though time and again, they've shown that they are for, they want more radical, they, they um, sorry, I, I, I'm not, I don't have COVID, don't want to <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I'm not saying I'm just great. But I, I don't have COVID. <laughs> I, I, I got it a month ago, sir. Uh, but uh, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I, what was I saying? Um, yes, so they have political aspirations. They have radical political aspirations of freedom and um, equality. I mean, we can see that in, we, we saw it in Arab Spring. We, we see it now, and they keep doing it. But then, of course, because of all the geopolitical powers and it's not just the U.S., it's Russia and mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it's just as if we can't talk about these mm -hmm. things, because if we do, then it means, I don't know, we are for, pro the West. So that's one of, I think it's just very complicated. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention. And I don't have the answer to that question, but I hope one day we like figure it out. Yeah. Um, and then another thing I wanted to answer in terms of what you were saying that some of what feminists uh, are doing, I mean, there's many, a lot of things that people were, have been doing, um, but uh, uh, in the very most recent uh, years, one of the things that I think was very important uh, was uh, the Farsi Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it started when, 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 three years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so the Farsi Me Too movement started and um, and it was very, I think it was very important for what is happening right exactly. now. Yeah. Uh, because, Can you explain what it is? 
Sorry, mm -hmm. what is the far CV to that? So, so people, so um, just there were testimonials and uh, stories of uh, sexual harassment, um, rape, uh, which I had signed in, say, uh, uh, that uh, people started. Um, um, uh, like make it public. And yeah, make it public in, on Twitter, on um, mm -hmm. Instagram, uh, and then uh, yeah, and then they it was some of them were like they would uh, say their names, but then sometimes it was anonymous. anonymous. Mostly it was anonymous, and <laughs> interestingly, a lot of uh, comrades like left men comrades mm -hmm. <laughs> were me too as well mm -hmm. so surprise yeah. <laughs> uh, so what happened i don't know I, I mean i don't know it's like kind of i think it's kind of i mean it's a very bad thing to say but in a way they're not that active the comrades yeah. men comrades so it meant that feminists and women were more on the forefront, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. uh, because they couldn't talk because they were canceled. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I think that was also an important thing. And another, another thing I wanted to say is that in comparison to the 1979 revolution with intellectuals, and maybe I'm wrong, you could hear, you know better, but I think intellectuals had more of a, um, role. Uh, I think since in, in the past six years, um, it's um, it's more people. I don't know how the word is for, uh, capital. Like uh, like more people in the streets that are ordinary people, I guess, not intellectuals that are actively fighting the state. And it started with uh, in in 2017, yeah. and then yeah. and then it yeah. and it's just every year something is going on. So and it and and they've also brought ethnicity in a mm -hmm. way in in the conversation mm -hmm. in a way that it can't be ignored anymore. Mm -hmm. So the Arabs did um, the. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just translating things in my head yeah, right now, uh, like the, the attention. Uh, who's a spot uh, in the uh, south of Iran yes. for water? Yes, yes, they were fighting for water and land. Uh, that happened in, I think, two years ago. I, I might be the dates, I might be wrong. And then, uh, and then we had another one. Uh, so, so I think there's this tension between intellect, not tension, I would say, but it's just different that the people who are like, leading, leading it yeah. is yeah. different than. Um, Maybe 1979. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, would you I, say so? I don't because you know better about the 1979. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I, don't know. I mean, intellectuals were suppressed then, and they're suppressed now. No, of course, suppressed. But everyone is in prison think, right now in Iran. Right. The intellectuals are in prison right. also, by the way. But I think what's different back then is that you did have um, more ideological certainty. You know, yeah. people were part yes. of ideological yeah. tendencies and frameworks, mm -hmm. and they were this kind of Marxism and that kind of thing. Yeah. And even if their parties were underground and suppressed, they had them, you mm -hmm. know, for better or for worse, they had them. And now we don't have that. No. That's mm -hmm. all been destroyed both by repression, but also by the, the political era, right? The kind of um, defunctness of a lot of those, um, you know, frameworks, right? And so I think, I know there are leftists in Iran who are trying to uh, <laughs> theorize new forms of class politics that are feminist, right? You know, that the, there are people who are, who are writing and doing these things, but it's been, um, but without any kind of parties or organizations or formations, right? So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's incredibly difficult and a lot of people have had to leave. So yeah. a lot of that's happening outside which I don't think should discredit it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, because people are so deeply connected to what's, um, to what is going on. Um, but yeah, should we get a thing? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, I was gonna say, thank you so much. And I think we have time for one or two more brief questions. Um, if you've got your burning question and comment, here's one, yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for this talk and I haven't had a chance to read the book. I also missed the beginning, so I don't know if you touched on this already, but I had a question about um, sort of how much the impetus of the book or how much you came across really problematic narrative that um, Iranians in the US and the diaspora are apolitical, um, especially I think as a result of sort of like crackdowns that they may have like faced in intellectual life or political life in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, 
also problematic because it like excludes political life outside of public office. Um, mm. So I was just curious oh, how much that, that kind of thing my narrative mind. is something you came across. Well, I'm. I think that that narrative comes post seventy nine, and the book is really focused on pre seventy nine, right? So it was that that wasn't really the the thing. But yes, after seventy nine, because of the hostage crisis, because of all the hostility and violence and racism and Islamophobia, a lot of Iranians just try to keep their heads down and pretend they're Italian or something, right? I mean, this just goes on for a long time. But you know, but but now. But now you, you can't find a member of the diaspora who's apolitical, whether we like their politics or not. Um, but but I, everybody is political now. Um, even if two months ago they didn't care, now they're political. And that's part of, anyway, when you have a mass movement, you get everybody. So it's um, it's very mixed. Um, but, but I guess, I, sorry, I did want to say, can I say yeah, one more? Please, please. Just Haley and John, because you said so many things, I forgot where you started. And I think maybe, maybe you, I don't know if you came in at the when we were talking about this, but, and Nadine, you really uplifted this in a way that was so meaningful to me because I feel like building Iranian Arab solidarity mm -hmm. is so important yes, in this moment is. and that it's something that has kind of been robbed from us because yeah. of the ways we've been pitted against each other regionally, mm -hmm. you know? And the only way we find it is sort of around a domestic politics of us opposing Islamophobia, but it's been very hard to actually build solidarity mm -hmm for example, among Iranians and Palestinians, because mm -hmm. the Iranian government, not only have they co-opted anti-imperialism, but they have co-opted Palestine, mm -hmm. you know, and they yeah. use it for their own regional imperialism, yeah. Yeah. you know, and so there's so much kind of um, undoing of the, the damage of that regime and what it's done to the region and to the possibilities for us to actually understand ourselves as on the same side, yeah. right? The Iran Iraq. Yeah, and the Iran Iraq, and it's you know it's no surprise that when Iraqis were protesting a couple of years ago, they were chanting out with the U.S. and out with Iran because I mean Iran is is mm -hmm. you know absolutely colonizing in all these ways, right? And trying to in interfere in Iraqi society. So exactly, it's like how do we fight against the divisions among Iranians and Arabs, not just here around. It's important to do it here around uh, fighting Islamophobia, but but in the region, you know. And so part of that really is. Um, Helia, what you said, and I, I think I think for me, it's about, you know, I like to reclaim things. So I want to reclaim anti-imperialism away from this government the same way. I mean, a decade ago, you couldn't say the word revolution because it was the, the language of the regime. Yeah. And that has changed. Yes. That is different now. And, and it's so important because, you know, more than a decade ago, you could only talk about reform. Right. And, and our horizons were narrowed in that way. But now revolution is on the agenda. That is where people are at. And those are the demands. And it and and so I think it's important to similarly, especially for us in the US, but also in the region. It's like we have to reclaim anti-imperialism. Otherwise, you know, Iranians really are um isolated, you know, really are isolated. Like if we want to build transnational solidarity, you know, we have to reconfigure how the geopolitical lines have been drawn. We have to reject. Mm -hmm. The existing camps and binaries, and we have to re we have to insist mm -hmm. that there are popular liberation movements from below that have more in common than we do mm -hmm. with uh, any of these exactly. nation states, right? Yeah. And like that has to be the basis of a different kind of uh, you know feminist uh, anti imperialism that I'm calling intersectional, but we can come up with other names for it too. So. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to you. Incredible, incredible. Every part of it, everybody's contributions were so wonderful, including thanks to everybody who had great questions and comments. And what a great place to end. And but it's not a total yeah. end because we have some wine and some snacks and treats, and we have books uh, somewhere. Where's the books? Yeah. 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 Um, so thank everybody so much for coming and making this a great event.